Blood Bricks, Untold Stories of Modern Slavery and Climate Change, brings together a collective of academic researchers from Cambodia and the United Kingdom. The photographs you are about to see were commissioned as part of the study and were taken by Thomas Christofaletti from the Rayun Collective in Cambodia. The Blood Bricks project, which ran between 2016 and 2019, explored the lives of debt-bonded labourers in Cambodian brick kilns and assessed the part that climate change plays in compelling workers to them. In the next 15 to 20 minutes, we will guide you through our findings. The research involved over 100 interviews with brick kiln workers and owners, 300 quantitative household surveys in kiln sending villages, particular air analysis in brick kilns, and the tracking of bricks from the kilns to the building sites of Phnom Penh, and vice versa. Moving from the city to the brick kiln, and finally back to the rural villages once called home, our research traces how urban development is built on unsustainable levels of debt taken on by rural families struggling to farm in one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world. In trying to repay microfinance loans taken on to cope with the destructive impacts of climate change on agrarian production, families from rural villages across Cambodia are forced to leave their homes to live and work in brick kilns from which they may never escape. Blood bricks embody, we argue, the converging traumas of modern slavery and climate change in our urban age. Our original research newly evidences connections between these issues that are too often considered separate from each other in policy and planning debates. We go beyond these silos. Cambodian brick kilns and their supply chains show the need for joined up approaches to tackle interconnected challenges within and beyond Cambodian borders. We have put together this infographic as a visual representation of our findings. Our research showed that the path of exploitation faced by brick workers is exacerbated by climate change, but is also rooted in poverty and inequality. To understand the experiences of multi-generational workforces of adults and children trapped in debt bondage in Cambodian brick kilns, we need to journey from the kiln to the construction sites of Phnom Penh and explore the domestic and foreign investment supporting Cambodia's vertical ascent. Cambodia is in the midst of a construction boom. The building of office blocks, factories, condominiums, housing estates, hotels and shopping malls is pushing its capital city upwards. But this vertical drive into the skies and the country's status as one of Asia's fastest growing economies hides a darker side to Phnom Penh's ascent. Building projects demand bricks in large quantities and there is a profitable domestic brick production industry supplying them, an industry profiting from modern slavery. We identified blood bricks in multiple developments in Phnom Penh. Most developments were domestically funded, however foreign investment was evidenced in at least one instance. In a high profile case of a luxury development including an international hotel chain, blood bricks were identified. The building was a joint venture between a Singaporean property developer and a Cambodian company. The 11th largest stakeholder is a well-known pension provider based in the UK. Blood bricks therefore offer an important yet overlooked vantage point from which to understand people's lives behind the domestic and global growth story of Cambodia's capital city. For the UK, they also show the seriousness and opacity of modern slavery concerns related to the investment practices of UK pension providers. The demand for bricks and the kiln workers who make them, however, are not the only inputs that are supporting Phnom Penh's ascent. The story of the bricks that enable this boom begins in the paddy fields to the north of Phnom Penh. 
Bricks begin as mud in the earth of rural Cambodia. Kiln owners initially purchase small parcels of land in villages known to have good clay soils and then proceed to build their land reserves in these villages such that small farmers are forced to sell their land. The environmental degradation of brick making starts here with the excavation of fertile soils. This also leads to the displacement of farmers, many of whom are forced to work in the brick kilns thereafter. Clay is excavated by labourers and brought in trucks to the kiln where it is piled up in mountains ready for use. Brick kilns also require huge volumes of wood, often illegally logged from rapidly diminishing forests. The unloading of forest wood takes place at night to evade authorities. But using wood is expensive. During our time in the kilns, we made a surprising discovery. We found offcuts from the garment industry being used to fuel the kilns. Garment offcuts discarded by factories are transported to a large dump on the outskirts of Phnom Penh. A follow-up national level survey of all brick kilns carried out by Dr Laurie Parsons from Royal Holloway includes data collection on the geographic distribution of various fuel types. It demonstrates that garments are burnt predominantly by kilns in Phnom Penh and its immediate vicinity. This is also where the majority of garment factories are located. Our research substantiates how garment waste is circulated and transformed across industrial spaces of the country's garment and construction industries in previously unreported ways. On the garment dump sites, workers sort the garment scraps into different sizes and sell these onto middlemen, who then distribute them to the brick kilns to be used as fuel. As this photo shows, labels on brick kilns include those of international fashion brands, including British ones. The UK is Europe's largest importer of garments from Cambodia. Brickmakers report severe respiratory problems from breathing in the burning pre-consumer waste. We undertook particular analysis when the garments were being burned. This showed consistent readings of 999.9 .9 micrograms per cubic metre of air for PM2.5 and PM10. These are the maximum readings possible. PM2.5 poses considerable health risk as fine particles can get deep into the lungs and even the bloodstream. Our research therefore adds th further weight to criticisms of fast fashion in the United Kingdom, including its negative environmental impact the use of toxic chemicals and increasing levels of textile waste. It also raises important questions about the environmental impacts of emissions in the construction industry and the health consequences on the ground for vulnerable workers. Unsafe machinery, extreme temperatures, brick dust and overwork in kilns contributed to other reported health issues. These were both chronic and fatal. Bleeding nostrils, lung inflammation, respiratory infections, vomiting, dizziness and fainting, physical exhaustion and limb amputation. As Bissette told us, my 14 year old son ran to play with a water buffalo and then came here and put his arm into the machine. It was cut off. I had to borrow more money. The owner gave me 1,400 US dollars. However, he cut this from my wages. Unrelenting and extreme working conditions also mean that some workers experience premature death. Others turn to coping mechanisms, like alcohol consumption, which also can have adverse health and social impacts. Some female participants reported an upscaling of domestic violence encountered since moving to the kiln site. Our research seeks to understand why anybody would enter such a situation. The truth is, nobody wants to. The brutality of life in brick making is renowned beyond the kilns. Rural Cambodians from villages without migration to brick kilns 
are well aware not only of the difficulty of the conditions, but also the one-way nature of the journey. Yet those who enter the brick industry have little choice but to do so. Almost invariably, they are the victims of a variety of factors conspiring to drive them into unsustainable debt in rural areas and from there to the kilns. Climate change is a key reason for the accumulation of debt. Across our three rural study sites, 83% of people stated that the temperature had risen in recent years, whilst 73% of people believed that the nature of rainfall had changed. Rooted in these shifts, 76% stated that drought had become more common, 42% reported more insect infestations and new animal species, and 35% indicated a higher rate of livestock disease. Attempting to deal with these conditions, farmers increasingly depend on costly private irrigation and pesticides, significantly increasing the cost of farming. The high levels of microfinance borrowing involved in irrigated farming place farmers at the mercy of the natural environment. Pests, floods or droughts may spell not only the end of a crop, but the end of rural life and the start of a journey to the brick kiln. Even for those who are just about coping in these difficult conditions, nobody is more than one illness away from debt bondage. Although money lenders have long been present in rural life, increasingly easy access to microfinance has seen families with ailing members accrue vast medical debts. Public facilities are often distant and difficult to access for those who need them most. This leads many to rely on expensive pharmacies and private clinics or to make do at home, as this photo shows. Health inequality is therefore a key issue in Cambodia's rural areas, and health problems in the family are a key factor driving people into unsustainable debt and ultimately debt bondage. Cambodia's microfinance sector is characterised by unfettered growth and in the last decade has been propelled by the entry of global financial institutions seeking a high return. As a result, the sector is one of the fastest growing globally, with 2.2 million borrowers today. In Cambodia, successive shifts towards deregulating and commercialising the sector over the past two decades have seen microfinance extended to precarious households. Borrowers are increasingly experiencing problems of over-indebtedness, compelling families to reduce food consumption, take out new loans to service prior debts, might great for work and even sell their land to repay a microloan. Our blood bricks research showed how child and debt bonded labour arises from this chronic over indebtedness too. It is also an issue that we are undertaking new research on in Cambodia and Tamil Nadu, South India until 2022. Funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund, the project examines the gendered implications of the push for microfinance lending in supporting resilience against climate disasters in the global south. The path to the kiln is paved then with climate change, poor state support of agriculture, poor public health and a predatory microfinance industry. For those who find themselves deep in debt, the brick kilns are a solution of the last resort. Brick kiln owners offered to buy the debt of those who approach them, consolidating all of their existing loans into a single bond. Brick workers must continue until this bond is repaid in full through their labour. For many, the poor pay they receive, combined with the health problems they in in inevitably suffer, sees their accumulation of debt rather than its repayment. For these many, the kiln will be their home and workplace until the end of their strength or their life. Debt bondage is also often intergenerational and children are forced to inherit their parents' debts when they become incapable of working on the kiln or they die. As Leader explained, when I came of age, they told me to sign my thumbprint on the debt contract in place of my parents my debt keeps on increasing now that I have a husband and children. In the future, my children will do the same, sign their thumbprints in my place. 
The kill renders workers and their families immobile through the bonds of debt, kinship and climate change. Cambodia's development over the last two decades has been one of rapid growth. Natural resources have plummeted downwards while urbanisation has climbed upwards. The price of all this altitude, the price of this height though, is paid by those at the bottom, the debt bonded labourers who shared their stories with us. So, what does this mean for the United Kingdom? First, while Cambodian bricks are not exported, there are important questions to be asked of British companies investing in construction projects overseas, including in Cambodia, which are using bricks made in conditions of modern slavery. Key issues arising include deficiencies in the Modern Slavery Act raised by the 2017 House of Lords and House of Commons Joint Committee on Human Rights. The committee acknowledged that whilst the Modern Slavery Act in 2015 had raised the profile of the problem of modern slavery within UK companies and their supply chains abroad, major improvements are needed to the effectiveness and accessibility of judicial mechanisms for holding UK businesses to account for human rights violations committed overseas. Our report, available on our website, also has more specific recommendations. With Brexit, it is also paramount that Britain looks to reconfirm and evidence its commitment to preferential trade based on conditions related to our country's human rights record. In Cambodia, for example, the EU's Everything But Arms scheme has been partially withdrawn from August 2020 as a result of systematic concerns related to human rights. Could Brexit further undermine human rights in Cambodia by offering preferential trade privileges without human rights conditions being met? Second, HMRC data on the monthly importation of bricks highlights a new trend shown here. The rise in brick imports from Asia and Oceania since 2017. Country level data records these imports specifically from Bangladesh, India, Pakistan and China. Aside from potential issues related to the quality and certification of these bricks, serious concerns have been raised in each of these countries about the widespread realities of debt bondage in their respective brick making industries. It is not necessarily that these bricks are cheaper to buy, but rather that the demand for bricks has outstripped reduction in the UK and more recently in the EU too. Procurement personnel who are committed to ethical and responsible practice in the construction industry have an important role to play in better managing scheduling so there is less need to source, at speed, bricks from outside the UK or EU. Critical questions also need to be asked about the provenance of bricks being imported from Asia and under what labour conditions they were made. This again raises the matter of Brexit and the UK's commitment to human rights. On this, Blood Bricks team member Laurie Parsons has recently received funding for a new follow-up project examining the human and environmental footprint of British trade in the Global South. Entitled The Next Frontier of Climate Policy, joining the dots of BRICS trade and embodied missions from Cambodia and Bangladesh to the UK, the 12-month study brings together experts in trade and supply chain analysis, embodied emissions and construction from Bangladesh, Cambodia and the UK to examine how UK trade exacerbates the human and environmental impacts of disasters such as floods, droughts and heat waves in the global south. This is a major issue. While official statistics show a reduction in domestically produced emissions since 1990, there is growing unease over the effectiveness of production-based UK emission targets which allow a growing proportion of greenhouse emissions to flow through the carbon loophole of international trade. In total, imported emissions now account for a quarter of global CO2 emissions, making this the next frontier of climate policy. Indeed, BRICS are part of a strengthening trend for the UK importation of low-value goods at high carbon cost. This picture of UK emissions is especially worrying, given the UK now imports 7% of its brick stock, the highest percentage in the world. The new trend for the importation of bricks, particularly from Asia, once again underscores complex connections between climate change and modern slavery, which our original research sets out. 
These are connections and domestic footprints which largely remain unaccounted for and unaddressed in UK government policy making. A human rights based approach to trade and investment moving forward into the post Brexit era is essential if the UK is to contribute to rather than undermine the prospects of inclusive, sustainable and equitable development outcomes in a changing climate.